I've given a few speeches recently, and um, I think that there's one big thing that I, that I missed in giving, these, uh, giving this story, because afterwards people always come up and ask uh, you know, the same couple of questions, which is, how did I wind up in this place? Because in the first four and, uh, last four and a half years, I've been living out in a tribal village in Jharkhand, uh, teaching football to girls, of all things. Um, so there's a good reason for it. You know, we're using football for youth development and to get girls into school and delay their marriage and try to prevent human trafficking. But uh, people rightly wonder, you know, they find it a little bit hard to believe uh, that I wind up there and wound up there. And, and truthfully, I, I think it's, you know, a little bit hard to believe myself. So I, I want to share that part with you before uh, getting into the story of, of what it is we're doing. Uh, people ask me out there, people ask me, uh, you know, my friends and people I meet in Delhi and Bombay, you know, what do I do in, in Jharkhand? You know, what is there to do? You know, is there social life? Is there parties? You know, a dating scene? Not really. <laughs> it's it's a, a rural village. And, um, it's a rural village. And uh, for the most part, when I moved there, you know, everybody was getting married off at age you know, 15 or 16. That was kind of the norm. Um, so I want to share with you kind of the story of how I wound up in this place. Um, and I'm calling this my adventure in rural India. I thought it would sound better if I called it a journey, but I thought that it's actually more of an adventure. So I, I, wound up, I came to Delhi in 2007 and worked until 2008 as a business consultant. And then I thought, you know, I wanted to do something a little bit more meaningful. You know, get out of this, you know, suit and tie. At least today I'm wearing some hiking boots, so I'm you know, sort of a hybrid. But uh, to get out of a suit and tie and get out of you know, meetings and hotels and do, do something more meaningful. So I wound up in an NGO in Jharkhand, which was funded by a steel company. And I still found myself, you know, kind of dressed up as if I was going to the office every day. So the first order of business for me was to try to get out of that. I started, uh, you know, connecting with local people, getting out of the NGO office, uh, playing football with local boys, really getting out of the office, interacting with some wildlife in the village. I traded in the car and driver for uh, Royal Enfield, and I kept trying to get people out of the office to you know, help me. I wanted to move into a village and really see what it was like. And nobody wanted to, um, to get out of the office, only this guy in the center who's a rock musician in, in Ranchi decided he would help me. And so we did some survey work, and I wound up in this place. This was my house for almost six months. Uh, in the interior lighting, the bed, the ceiling. This is me under my pink mosquito net <laughs> at night. And in the village, I noticed a couple things. One, the thing that stood out the most was the difference between the lives of boys and girls. Uh, boys were generally doing something like this. Just, just sort of hanging out. Girls were usually doing something like this. Or this. And so I thought, how can I actually you know, connect with these kids? Because people in the NGO didn't want to get out of the office. So I, I started teaching at a local school. These were my students. Uh, these are two of them. Remember their names because we're going to talk about them a little bit. We're going to kind of revisit these two a little bit later. This is Nita and Shivani. And this girl on the left was one of the students that said she wanted to play football. So I said, if you start a team, I'll coach you. You know, I'd never played football uh, really in my life until I came to India. I played ice hockey and I, I was a skier. Um, I did judo, but you know, this wasn't my sport. But I said, okay, if you, if you want to start a team, we'll coach it. And the girls, their dedication was, was absolutely amazing. We thought we would do, uh, you know, use football for boys and girls. Uh, but the girls were so much more dedicated than the boys. And they were all, also much cuter. Look at this group, compared to this group. <laughs> so, this is why, you know, we, we said we're going to go with these guys. And so while the boys were sleeping in the morning, the girls were doing this. This was taken at about 4.45 in the morning uh, during the first year. They would come before dark, uh, before light, I mean. And they would come by foot. Some girls got more creative. You know, swapped, they swiped their dad's motorcycles. They got younger and younger. Pretty much everybody was coming. Little by little, they became, uh, little by little, they became a team. 
And these sort of teams emerged, and that was the biggest, uh, that was the biggest change and the thing that we were able to build the most off of. That these girls who uh, before had sort of a support system or friendship of you know, uh, five or six you know, girls that they were friends with now became part of something much bigger where their you know, peers were taking care of them. And so they got quite strong. And this unity was, was the most important thing. They got assertive, sometimes a little bit too assertive. This girl in the, in the white is actually, she's one of our players and she's uh, on the Indian national team right now. Uh, here's a girl named Neelam who, her mom wanted to get her married off uh, at age 15 because uh, her mom said she was getting tall. You know, so she was getting tall enough to get married. <laughs> But luckily that, that didn't happen. Uh, there's another girl named Mina whose, whose father was shot and killed. She and, and uh, Neelam are both now our coaches. Here's Shivani again, getting a little bit bigger. This is in her house. And, and Shivani and, and this girl, all these girls started going back to school because we, we started using their teams and their team captains in a positive peer pressure to get them uh, back engaged in school. So Shivani kind of, you know, transformed from this, you know, in, into something much bigger. So the, um, this unity was, was really the, the thing that we were able to build off of. And now a couple of, the next question people have oftentimes asked me is, you know, what have I learned? Because I know that a lot of people, uh, you know, in the cities and at, at uh, good universities like this one want to do something, you know, worthwhile for society, they want to go get engaged. Uh, teach kids or somehow do something, you know, to make the world a better place. So I'm going to share three lessons that I've learned over the last four and a half years. Uh, before I do that, I'm going to let uh, the girls in our program speak for themselves. Okay, here. So where are we right now? Uh, we are in uh, my house. Uh, so, so okay. <laughs> Iva is a football club in which we learn football. We learn a lot of football. We learn a lot of things. We learn a lot of people. I play in Iva uh, because uh, it is not like government. Government, uh, government und uh, don't understand us, but Iva understands. Iva is good for us. बहुत से बच्चे जीत के आए हैं और वे उनमें बहुत सी कॉन्फिडेंस है वे आगे बहुत कुछ कर सकते हैं। Before I join Yuva, I have only five six friends. But then when I when I join Yuva, I have fifty sixty friends. Girls, they don't play Yuva. They forget his. Uh, uh, they forget their opportunity, and uh, they have a boring life. And uh, uh, whose whose girls join you? Uh, we have one. We saw that in public in Jharkhand, uh, in India, that I am the best and we are the best. The first lesson I learned, and this was actually counterintuitive for me, was that, uh, was that the poor are just like us, only they're poor. They've got a lot of the same problems, a lot of the same issues, and I, but, but one thing they had was a work ethic, and I, and I realized that by sometimes in, in trying to help, you know, I was actually discouraging that work ethic. So I had to try to figure out you know, how, to, uh, how to help without actually you know, uh, ruining what was, what was best in these guys and what was going to help them get ahead in the future. And the, the big difference I saw between girls and boys was that when a group of girls would come to us and say that they wanted to make a team, we'd ask them three questions. And the first was, how often do you want to play? And they always said every day. The second was, what do you need to play? And they would kind of shyly, you know, consult each other and say, 
you know, a, a ball, a place to play, a coach. And that was it. Third question, you know, how, how are you going to get these things? And they would again kind of consult each other and they'd say, we'll save for it. Now the boys oftentimes were kind of standing behind the girls and, and they didn't want to miss out on something. So they said, wait a minute, we want to do this as well. And same three questions, uh, how often do you want to play? I've had boys say, well, if you go to the field, meaning myself and the coaches we train, if, if you go to the field, we might come. If there's not something better going on, if there's not a card game or, or something, we'll, we'll come. So you please go and, and we might come. And second question, you know, what do you need to play? Literally everything that they've seen Cristiano Ronaldo wearing on TV <laughs> is what, what they think that they need just to start. And number three, okay, you know, boys, how are you going to get these things? They look at you like you're nuts, like you're joking. They say, Op DJ. <laughs> you know, you, you're going to give it, obviously. That's how things work around here. And so for the, for the girls, I, I wanted to figure out a way of um, kind of knocking the ceiling off you know, their lives, helping them to get ahead without ruining what was best about them, which was you know, their straightforwardness, their work ethic. Number two, another big lesson uh, that I learned was that sometimes taking the time at the beginning is actually the real shortcut. And I'm kind of borrowing that phrase from an author named Murakami. Uh, but I think that there's a temptation com coming out of fancy schools uh, like you are, like I did, to try to come up with some really fancy ideas. But there's another quote by Muhammad Yunus, who I think all of you probably know who, who he is. He said, if you take the speed of a horse, the majesty of a lion, the courage of a tiger, and the elegance of a deer, in theory, you're going to have a super animal, but in practice, it might never get off the ground. So that was that's something I constantly uh, kind of see uh, NGOs and people who want to do something good struggling with. Number three, the third lesson, and this is another quote that I'm borrowing from somebody. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you really don't understand it yourself. And that was Einstein who said that. Um, a case in point is that uh, you know, the, the girls would get on the field very early in the morning and men would kind of get going later on. But in order to go perform you know, their morning ablutions, they would have to cross the football field go down you know, by the river and relieve themselves. But they were kind of maybe getting a little bit excited for what was in store for them down at the river, and they would stop on the field and start trying to coach. And um, their coaching style was sort of, you know, uh, let's see if I can kind of imitate this maybe. It's like, are you doing what you want? No, 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 no. No, 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 no. So this isn't really how we learn you know, best from a teacher. If you can't explain it, or better yet, demonstrate it to a six-year-old, uh, you really don't understand it yourself. And uh, one of the biggest, uh, one of the most important rules we have in our, our program is that you know, there are no laps, no lines, no lectures. And that's not just about football, that's about kind of any type of teaching. You know, as Confucius said, I, I, I hear, I forget, I see, I remember, I do, I understand. And uh, so if you, if you really want to help, you know, help them to do, like, you know, we're doing here with a, a girl named Kusum, who's now a, a Khan Academy trainer for us. You know, they're, they're coming up with their own plans for what they want to be doing. So we'll go through a couple quick stories of these girls. Uh, Nita and Shivani, where are they now? Are they both on the Indian national team? On the left and right. Uh, Nita is also a Khan Academy trainer. She's you know, very young, she's only 12 years old, but uh, she's moved from a government school into a private school and she's near the top of her class. This is Shivani, still struggles a bit academically, but uh, her father was actually, unlike most fathers, he was very supportive. And he told her that he thought she'd make it onto the Indian national team one day. Now, last year he passed away, and then about four months afterwards, she actually did make it onto the Indian national team. <laughs> uh, so this is her with the family. Mine is the father. Now, Neelam, where is she now? She's not yet married, and she's actually becoming one of our best coaches. Still carries heavy stuff on her head. 
still lives here, but she's coaching, and she's actually um, living in Bombay for part of the year, uh, coaching girls in Darby slum. Now Mina, her dad was shot and killed. She's got uh, lots of responsibilities, but she, here she is uh, taking training at Baichan Bhutia Football Schools. And here she is, also in Bombay, coaching. Um, and what, so something which was counterculture before girls playing football, you know, now what do we see? Everybody's watching it. People are hanging off of, you know, school roofs, hanging out of trees to get a glimpse of, of what's going on. So it's actually become part of the social fabric. And again, it's not about football, it's about unity. It's about, you know, people uh, coming together to improve themselves. It's a powerful mechanism for that. And then, what about me? Where am I living now? I moved out of the mud house. Uh, we won a Nike grant. We cleaned the place up. Hired some local people. And uh, built uh, something a little bit more proper. So that's where I'm at. So people, people ask me, you know, how can I get started? Uh, I think the, the biggest thing to do is just get up and, you know, get up and do it. You know, uh, um, were, all of us are pretty smart people, that's why you're you know, at this university, but real genius is not in the theory or in the planning, it's in the practice. And I think actually more genius is trying to find hidden genius in other people and trying to build that. And so what do you need? I think uh, you, know, you need endurance, uh, you need a sense of humor. Uh, endurance is also... Remember I said I read a lot because it's not a big you know, party and, and social scene in, in the rural village. I read a book about an Arctic explorer called Ernest Shackleton, and his, his ship was called Endurance. Now the ship broke down. You know, uh, Endurance took him on a wild ride. I think Endurance can also take you on a, a wild ride. Uh, it, not, not necessarily the most comfortable ride. He got stranded in the Arctic, but sort of an epic journey or epic adventure. So that was what I did for him, and I hope that I will also do the same for you. <laughs>